Grace and peace to each one of you this day in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you would please join me in a, in a quick word of prayer. Um, gracious Lord, thank you for the gift of your spirit. We ask that it might be granted to us um, to lead us to follow Jesus into this broken world. That even when we are filled with pain or uncertainty or disorientation, we might bring hope and healing to our neighbors. Be with us now in our thoughts and in our words. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I have a friend named Pat Dever from Illinois. She and I first met because she was an administrator with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and was helping us with the church loan for our first set of buildings down in Illinois. She later moved to the western suburbs of Chicago and became a friend of mine and a member of our congregation. And on a very crisp, beautiful September morning, she and I were to have coffee together. And on the way there, there was a radio report on, the, on WGN in Chicago that a small plane had hit one of the skyscrapers in New York City. Not exactly accurate, but it was the first word. Pat soon called me up and said, you know, I haven't left my house yet. You should turn on the television set. I don't think we're going to get together today. So I don't know who you were with or where you were, but that, done, that day unfolded in a way that I'm sure you remember today. Somewhere over the course of that day, my wife's boss called me, an administrator for a large orthopedic practice in the western suburbs of Chicago, and asked me to come and pray with their staff because they were having such a horrible day. I've never been asked to do anything like that before or since gathered all these surgeons and physician assistants and nurses and PT people in the atrium of their building and stumbled around for some words to say. By the end of that day, um, we had thrown together a prayer service at Rejoice in our brand new building. And um, all I remember, that's a blur of a worship service, all I remember are candlelights and prayers and some music, some tears, and silence. Because there just weren't words. We could bring to bear some of God's promise and some of God's words, but finally, it all seems so inadequate, and in many ways it still does. And perhaps every generation goes through a moment in time that turns everything upside down. Certainly my parents did. And now we have. But in a way in which um, this particular event has left our culture still unsure as to what it means. World War II perhaps felt clearer. There was more of a victory somewhere and an end and a starting over. And this feels different than that, doesn't it? We're just left with some new realities that we're still trying to understand. I wrestled with this message more than I have with anything for a long, long time because there's so much ground and places I don't want to go to today. But we're going to try. And my guess is you have a lot of thoughts and feelings perhaps you've not ever articulated, but that hopefully this will serve to bring them up to a conversation. Okay. A lot has happened in these 10 years. Thousands of lives lost on that day and on the days since. Thousands of families who have watched sons and daughters leave, some of whom didn't come back, and some of whom didn't come back whole. Uh, countries way on the other side of the world, people we don't really know, and cultures we barely have begun to understand have been impacted. Billions of dollars in years that seem to have just spun out of control. Profound and disorienting, tragic and costly. So what do we say today? A few things. First is to remember, as individuals, and I guess I should say this at the beginning, events like this that involve all of us are informative on that scale and also informative 
and parallel events that happen on a much smaller level in our individual lives. As a culture and as a nation, we have certainly experienced a, an event that turned us upside down, but individually, we each have endured moments in time that have turned our individual lives upside down. And here the point is that remembering is important. That it is important to remember the victims and the loss and the grief. And it's important today, and, and many of you probably woke up and turned on the television set and heard the reading of the names today. And for the children that don't know their mother or their father, and for the parents who have lost their son or daughter, for the communities that were changed, for the corporations that were changed, who now have um, big gaping holes in their lives. It is important to honor and to remember and to give thanks for those lives. And so too, in our own life, we go through profound moments of disorientation that we need to remember even when they're painful. And in that remembering, we are called to create meaning out of these things. And I think that's where we struggle as a people with this event, because the meaning of it seems so difficult for us to articulate well and to know for certain. But it's only in the remembering that we can begin to create meaning, and we need to. For lives lost and lives changed it is the only honorable thing we can do is to construct a meaning out of it that's helpful and life-giving. The second thing to remember today is the better side of humanity that was put um, and made visible that day. That there are people who put themselves in harm's way. And that human spirit that bravery that calls somebody to run into danger and into brokenness and to put themselves in harm's way is the most noble part of our human spirit. It is a gift from God. It is the most full expression of Jesus' admonition to love your neighbor as yourself that one can imagine. And so today, among the names read are those first responders, policemen, firefighters, citizens who simply reached out and ran into harm's way. And there must just be a special blessing when the human spirit rises up in such a powerful way. We also give thanks for those who have raised their hand since and have put their life on hold and have made new choices and reached out in new vocations sons and daughters who have joined the military, people who have joined nonprofit organizations, people who have served in government, anyone who has raised their hand and stepped forward to say, I somehow want and need to help. We give thanks for that part of the human spirit. And I'm sure there are a lot of mothers and fathers that are sitting in their homes today and thinking about their sons and daughters far away and in harm's way. And for them, we need to give them honor and respect and thanksgiving. For the majority of those people do connect that call to service with a call from God. And that's an honorable thing. Today is also important to remember that there is both good and evil in this world. That Jesus himself fully acknowledged the fact that this was a broken world and a world full of pain and a world where people willfully do to one another what should not be done. And that you and I need to remember that we walk into this world with our eyes wide open to the fact that there is evil in this world and there is violence in this world. And that those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus need to stand up and stand against and name that which is evil and wrong and hurtful. It's not always easy to do. And we need to be careful in our judgments. But we need to understand that this world is still a broken place. And that we have a calling 
to be God's people in the midst of that brokenness and to stand with those who are victimized, hurt, oppressed, or marginalized, and to stand for the goodness that God is doing in this world. The songs that we sang today with these visions of peace and hope, and, and frankly, the reason we included all of the scripture from the diverse traditions of this world is to point out the fact that all people who name God in however way they wish see a vision for peace in this world, and that's something we need to remember. The fourth thing that I thought about as I put together this message today is that this world is just one world, and that has become more and more obvious. The world becomes smaller and more connected every day. And then in a way in which my children, who are 20 and 22, now experience the world, fluent in another language, friends from other countries, having lived overseas for significant periods of time, they have experienced the world differently than I did at age 20, and certainly different than the way their grandparents experienced this world. As I um, stood at commencement at Gustavus Adolphus College this, this um, spring, and saw this student body launch out into the world, many of them were absolutely going out into the world and to serve and to work in many and various places. They are experiencing the world and see the world differently than I did, and I think it's a good thing that this world increasingly gets smaller and more and more connected, and in that is great hope. But it also brings great challenge, doesn't it? Diversity and difference requires us to be patient with one another, to listen to one another, to learn about foreign and distant places and different cultures and even different religions, and to seek out the points of connection and similarity and commonality and desire. And we as Christians need to bring to bear to that the realization that God loved the whole world and that indeed God sent Jesus because God loved the entire world not just our little slice or our little moment in time or our little culture, but that God loves the whole world and so too you and I are called to love the whole world. And in that brings challenges and great responsibility, but I think also great hope. That it is the children of our children that stand a wonderful chance to look around this whole world and see friends and family. Now this next one you may need to forgive your pastor for before he starts, okay? You have to understand a couple of things about me. I grew up in a moderate Republican household. I've been an independent most of my life. I love politics, and if I wouldn't have been a pastor, my greatest dream in my life was to become a constitutional lawyer. I was a debate geek. I know politics really well. I served in the, in the, in the, in the Minnesota Congress as a research intern when I was in high school in the Minnesota House, Republican, or House of Representatives. I really enjoy politics, and it's one of the frustrations of my vocation is that I can't be politically active. Anyway, it wouldn't matter if we were sitting here in the United States or if we were in um, Europe somewhere or Asia, but I feel incumbent to say this. I feel, I feel called to say this today, that we need to always know that our politics are informed by our faith and not the other way around. And that one of the things that has become most troubling to me personally, and I'm only speaking personally here, and I don't mean to abuse my privilege and, and, and responsibility of preaching, but that over the course of time, in American politics, it seems like Christianity is used like a toy and a hot button. And the rhetoric around bad theology is stunning to me. And the caricature of what Christians are and what Christians believe that's prevalent in the media and in politics today is something that is not serving us well or our neighbors well or this world well. And it's time for those of us who are mainline, mainstream Christian people to connect the dots between our faith and public policy. Now that may lead us in very different directions. Christians come in many forms, conservative and liberal, Republican and Democrat, Progressive and Tea Party. But we need to be um, careful and intentional about how we apply our faith to our public lives and indeed even our political opinions. 
and I think it's time for those in the mainstream of Christianity to find their voice and to take up the responsibility of connecting the dots between their faith and what passes as public policy. Enough said. As a preacher, I can say that. As a Christian, it's up for you to figure out how to live that out. But I support you in that. And it's not easy. Okay. Two last thoughts. First, and this is where the macro and the micro, the global and the personal intersect, moments in time when the world gets turned upside down occasion us to reorient ourselves in a new way. And that moments in time can change us forever, but the change that results in that is more in our control than we believe. Now again, on a personal level, there's all sorts of events that disorient us, most of which we wish would never happen. And we yearn for the brokenness to be healed and to return back to our previous orientation. Whenever we suffer loss, death, we wish for that to happen. But the truth is, that we can never go back to that old orientation. Once it is broken and broken open, we cannot return there, but we cannot also sit in this pain forever. And we believe in a God that has the power to turn our pain and grief into a new orientation that is life-giving, hopeful, and positive. And that just as a nation needs to heal, but not return to a previous orientation, but find a new one, so too as individuals, we need to have hope that God takes our disorientation and moves us into a new day. For finally, we are people that live on this side of Easter and on this side of Good Friday, and we remember that God moves us from death to life, from brokenness to wholeness, from darkness to light, all of those metaphors. And as Christian people, we need to always remember that healing is an attitude and a posture, a hope and a trust. It requires action and intention on our part to hold on to the powerful, life-giving force of God. And then lastly, followers of Jesus have, have not so much been called into a life of um, glory. We have been called into a broken world. And I am an optimist. I'm like a raging optimist. Okay? But this is an important point for me. That I need to remember all the time that God calls me into brokenness. And it's as intimate as, as when the people I love and know the most hurt, I'm called to walk into that with them. And it's globally true that in a community in a world, in a nation that's broken, as people of Jesus, we are, fought, we are called to go into that brokenness, to go into that breach, to go into that despair and that disorientation, which means we can't ignore it or deny it, but we walk into it. And we bring something into that. Sometimes it's as simple as just the presence. Sometimes it is our hope, it is our love, it's our healing. It's all the gifts that God has given us, but we bring that to bear in a hurting world. And it is there that we find our vocation and our life and even our joy. So when the world around us is turned upside down, we are called to go in to that brokenness. Because we know the end of all things. We can risk the fear and the anxiety and even the brokenness that we may experience when we rush in because we know finally God holds this future of this world in God's hands. And we have nothing to fear. We have been the redeemed, the healed, the graced, the loved, beyond measure. And there is more. And so we can walk into this world's brokenness and offer everything we have because we know who holds the end of all things. Well, on this day of remembrance, may it be a day that is uh, filled with meaning for you as a follower of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.